So, welcome to this journal club for uh, vascular heart disease and structural interventions. It is unique for us uh, because it's a collaboration between three journals, Jack Case Reports, Jack Interventions, and Jack uh, Cardiovascular Imaging. Also, it's very important for us to, that, to interact with you, with the audience. So, please submit your questions. Um, I want to clarify the way that we selected this four case that we will be presenting that they are the, the ones that they had the highest scores in terms of uh, peer review. So now it's a great honor to welcome Dr. William Zogby, uh, who is a renowned cardiologist, echocardiographer, and cardiac imaging expert, Elkins Family Distinguished Chair in Cardiac Health, the Becky Heart and Vascular Center, and Chair of the Department of Cardiology at Houston Methodist. And uh, also, he's a deputy editor for Jack Cardiovascular Imaging. Then uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Nicolo Piazza, who is a world leader in structural interventions, director of structural interventions at McGill uh, in Canada, also associate editor for Jack Interventions. Dr. Nadine Faza, she's assistant professor of cardiology at Houston Methodist and CME editor for Jack Case Reports. Dr. Mauricio Teramaso, he's the director of structural interventions for University of Zurich and associate editor for Jack Case Reports. Dr. Edgar Argulian, he's Associate Professor of Medicine and Program Director for the Cardiovascular Disease Fellowship at Mount Sinai in Morning Day, Morningside and Associate Editor for Jack Case Reports. And Dr. Rafael Vidal Perez, Cardiology Attending Cardiac Imaging Unit at University Hospital in La Coruña in Spain, and of course our Associate Editor. So after the introductions, uh, we'll move uh, straight away to the first case, and I will give the word to Dr. Nadine Faza. Nadine. Thank you so much, Dr. Grapsa. It's an honor being here today with you all. We'll start with the first case describing catheter restoration of left ventricular outlet in a patient with an implanted apico aortic conduit. All right. So our patient is a 56 year old gentleman who in the year of 2007, underwent aortic valve bypass surgery. He is notable for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma when he was an adolescent, and that was accompanied by extensive radiation of the chest and resection of the right lower lobe of the lung. At the age of 44, he developed symptomatic aortic stenosis. Here, his aortic valve area was about uh, 0.9 with a mean gradient of 50 in the 50s, um, with extensive aortic calcifications uh, leading to a porcelain aorta. Because of that, he was not an ideal candidate for traditional aortic valve surgical replacement and instead underwent implantation of a conduit bearing a mechanical 21 millimeter bileaflet prosthesis from the apex of the LV to the descending thoracic aorta. It's uh, important to mention that at that time, TAVR was not um, an, an option uh, for management. Right after this echo aortic uh, conduit, his uh, transthoracic echo confirmed a low pressure inside the bypass with a mean pressure gradient of eight millimeters of mercury. The transvalvular gradient of his native aortic valve decreased to less than 10 because there was less flow through the native LVOT and more flow through the conduit. 12 years after this initial intervention, he developed symptoms of heart failure and imaging studies revealed uh, significant native valve aortic regurgitation with a pressure half time of 170 to 290 and a regurgitant volume of 50 cc's. So he still had his conduit, but on top developed severe regurgitation of his native valve. You know, based on the heart team discussion, the plan was to evaluate the patient for a uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement as that technology was being offered. And prior to that, a CT was performed for procedural planning. And these are some imaging of um, his uh, cardiac CT, and you can appreciate the severely calcified aorta, the extensive calcification of the aortic annulus, um, and the LVOT. This all leads to a very hostile landing zone, um, making it uh, technically challenging to replace the valve. For that specific case, and given the excessive calcification, simulation software using the heart guide was used. For this specific case, the lotus edge valve was um, decided to be used to decrease the amount of PVL and to decrease the risk of annular rupture. 
and using this simulation software, you can appreciate that the higher implant versus the implant versus the lower implant um, led to less uh, square deformation, contact pressure, translating to less uh, possibility of conduction abnormalities, and both high and low implants led to similar uh, degrees of periodic regurgitation. So this figure kind of demonstrates the importance of simulation softwares in determining the ideal position of valve implantation in such complex scenarios. These are also pre-procedural uh, CT images showing both the mechanical valve and the atypical aortic conduit showing normal function, as well as the native aortic valve, which has developed severe aortic regurgitation. You know, you can appreciate the leaflet and angular calcifications and the extensive calcifications in the ascending aorta. On the right side, you're also seeing the two outlets of the left ventricle, one through the native LDOT, through the sinus and regurgitant valve, and the other through the apex, through the apical aortic conduit. The patient underwent a transcatheter aortic valve replacement with the lotus edge valve. Um, and we have the intraprocedural angiography results showing mild PVL. For this specific case, the Sentinel device was used for cerebral protection and a two, wide, uh, two wire uh, guide uh, technique was used where two stiff wires were used, one into um, the non corner cusp through a J wire and the other one to guide the valve into the uh, aortic annulus. On the right, you see the post procedural transosophageal images showing a well seated valve with mild PVL. The patient did very well symptomatically and had a New York Heart Association class of one post procedural. In addition, he underwent post procedural MRI imaging and you can appreciate the flow through the lotus valve imaged as red and the flow through the conduit. You know, given the success of the transcatheter valve replacement, there was less flow going through the conduit and more flow going through the um, transcatheter valve. And the bottom panel also shows the simulation images uh, by CT in addition to the fluoroscopic images of the deployed valve. So this case really highlights the importance of a multimodality approach to pre-procedural planning and procedural follow-up of, of complex uh, structural heart interventions. And um, Dr. Zogby, I was hoping you'd, you'd share some of your thoughts on, on the case that we've described and your approach to multimodality imaging um, of transcatheter uh, valves. I know you're one of the authors of, you're the main author of the guidelines for the evaluation of valve regurgitation and transcatheter interventions and would appreciate your valuable feedback. Dr. Zogby. Uh, maybe he's muted. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> first, thank you, Dr. Faza, for uh, your and Dr. Grabsa also for your invitation to participate in this uh, wonderful panel discussion of great cases. I think your first case here is truly amazing because uh, it tells us so many things. One, is that the availability of such a procedure in patients who, uh, just like you saw before, this patient had to have a conduit before. And I think nowadays uh, this would be most often in a historical perspective because, uh, you know, nowadays you could do a TAVR procedure in the vast majority. So that's number one to me. Uh, number two is using uh, multimodality imaging uh, to decide on the approach, to also decide on the type of valve that you're inserting. And, uh, and because this, there was quite a bit of calcifications going into the LV alpha tract, uh, the simulation techniques uh, that can be done to assess of where or how high or low that you need to implant such a valve and also the type of valve that you could almost dial in to try to decrease the complications and the paravalvular regurgitation that may ensue. So um, it, it really is, uh, is, is a feast here of technology and, uh, and our new approach to it. 
And what you see here in, in front of you on, on the screen is, is a great review of the role of multimodality imaging in TAVR. And this was recently published in Jack Imaging. And it highlights, uh, you can dig deep into each one of these, but these are the different areas where, where you need imaging to make a decision, not only on the, on the timing of intervention, but also the type of intervention, the approach that you need. It doesn't mean that you need multimodality imaging in every case. But we know CT is going to be very important, and your transthoracic echocardiogram very important. If you don't have CT facilities, as well as a, yes, you could use transesophageal. And nowadays, I think most of the time for monitoring the situation, we use less transthoracic transesophageal, and we use more transthoracic. Uh, and NTE is needed in, in certain situations. So from and I'll I'll name them from low flow, low gradient, severe AS where, you know, uh, I think we'll have a later case where you had less calcifications. So physio physiology is still going to be very important in your evaluation in these situations. When you have multivalvular disease, CMR also can be used to look at quantitation of these lesions, right? Uh, valve and valve, that's a different issue. Uh, thrombosis of the valve, um, you know, TEE and CT, I think, are very important for you prosthesis mismatch, native aortic regurgitation, bicuspid valve, and aortic annulus sizing. I think these are very important. And we know some of the limitations of echocardiography in that situation. So CT is truly a gold standard in those situations here. So um, I cannot overemphasize the importance of knowledge of this. And I know our structural guys are very, very astute in using these various modalities uh, you know, to, to target a certain question or, uh, you know, a particular issue that comes on board. So I would refer you to this very nice publication here from Jack Imaging to do that. Now, uh, Nadine, there is, I think, another publication that we would like, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Piazza to, uh, to say some words about. Yes, Dr. Zogby, it's the Jack Interventions paper. Dr. Piazza, now that we have uh, TAVR widely available and with, with more patients undergoing TAVR uh, valve and valve procedures, um, would appreciate you shedding some light on coronary access in such, in such cases. Okay, so I'm un unmuted. So I, I think this last case that was presented um, in a very young patient ties in very well with coronary access after TAVR. Um, you know, one thing that struck me uh, when discussing this last case was the lifetime management of aortic stenosis uh, as it relates to a very young patient and trying to carry the patient, you know, from the age of 30, 40, uh, well into their later decades in life. Uh, safely uh, with the, um, you know, uh, lowest amount of interventions possible. Uh, and of course, you know, when you think about aortic stenosis in the 30 or 40 year old, um, you know, the concept of a mechanical aortic valve comes into play quite strongly um, because we know that bioprosthetic valves have a durability that is uh, less than uh, what we expect in elderly patients. Um, and, and this patient did not have a choice. Uh, I think, uh, you know, this concept of uh, the concept of creating a, a conduit between the LV and aorta has provided the patient with 12 extra years uh, without needing a valve. So uh, in, in some ways, he's gotten a valve with with 12 years durability at the age of, of, th of 30 or 40. I, I forget what how old he was. Uh, so that was, uh, I, I, you know, that was pretty uh, revealing to me, and it's something I'll keep in the back of my mind as a as a potential treatment option in my patients in the future. Uh, now, coming, uh, you know, when I saw this valve implanted, uh, of course, my my thoughts went to the coronaries uh, because on CT scan, uh, I did see that there was calcification of the coronary arteries, and you can also see it on the uh, fluoroscopic images. And so, um, you know, the, the depth of implant of this lotus, lotus valve becomes very important um, and how much clearance you have 
uh, for for coronary access. When when you think about when you think about coronary access, uh, you think of two valve designs. You have the intraannular valve designs, and you have the supraannular valve designs. Uh, we know from previous studies that the coronary axis is nearly 100% selective in those with intraannular valve design. So uh, balloon expandable, mechanical expandable, as this patient had. Uh, and the selective intubation of coronary arteries drops down to about 50 or 60% with, with um, self-expanding valves that span the height of the uh, sinotubular junction. Um, you know, so, you know, you have a nice image there on the left hand side, uh, the central illustration uh, demonstrating what a valve and valve looks like uh, with two super annular designs. Uh, and of course, you can imagine that the cross linking of, of the two frames uh, leads to a jailing of the uh, coronary arteries. Not only that, the fact that these leaflets are super annular. When you implant a second valve, those leaflets are going to be pushed aside and those leaflets are sitting at the level of the coronary arteries. So you're basically creating an elongated tube. Um, and so, you know, my 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 preference uh, when when not having a choice of, um, you know, meaning not a choice of surgical or transcatheter, but that you have to implant a transcatheter valve in a young patient would be to implant a valve that is intraannular short uh, that would allow you to in the future do another valve and valve potentially with the similar valve uh, and if you have to of course you move on to a superannular design uh, self-expanding um, in order to keep patencies of the uh, of the arteries for intubation so um, just a question from my side so you think that the the operator will think because he's still a young man that in 20 years from now he might need another valve and valve so he takes this uh, into consideration on the valve that they will use Cor correct julia you know uh, the um we know that if you implant a bioprosthetic valve in a patient below the age of 50 their lifetime risk of a redo surgery is somewhere between 60 and 70%. Uh, and so, uh, you know, this valve will fail and I don't think it's going to last 10 years. Um, you're, you're looking at a valve that was implanted in a very hostile environment that did not reach its nominal geometry. The leaflets are probably pinwheeled and there's a lot of bending stresses on those leaflets in a young patient. I, I don't give the, you know, the durability is not very enthusiastic within this patient. Um, so he will need another valve within five to 10 years for sure. I agree with you. Uh, the other question, I know we want to move on probably to the next case, but a, just a thought. Remember that I'm just wondering about the flow in these two valve conduits, right? The uh, Now that you have competing flow and what effect would it have? on durability of a bioprosthesis because it'd be interesting to see how much flow is going to each one of them. So, yeah. um, but, but a great case and I think, I mean, that's great help to this patient, so. That's perfect. Um, if we have time at the end, I have one more question that uh, we can go to the next case and then uh, leave some discussion towards the end. Um, thank you very much, uh, Nadine, thank you very much and Dr. Zobi and Dr. Piazza. I will move to the next case, uh, which will be presented by uh, Dr. Edgar Argulian. Hi, Julia, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, great. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me, and it's a, glad, a great pleasure to be part of this meeting. So the, the current, the second case, uh, describes a very uncommon cause of tricuspid regurgitation, and it's authored by a group from um, NYU in the New York City. So uh, they present a 48-year-old man who came to the hospital with symptoms of lightheadedness, shortness of breath, and near syncope. So the relevant history, which is very interesting, is a motor vehicle accident sustained nearly 30 years ago uh, when he hit his chest against the steering wheel. 30, almost 30 years ago. So in the emergency room, uh, he was found to have 
atrial tachycardia, and that triggered several imaging studies, uh, which we'll uh, discuss uh, in this presentation. So the transthoracic echocardiogram, which we're not showing here, but it showed normal left heart chambers with significant dilation of the right heart and uh, severe tricuspid regurgitation. So trans esophageal echocardiogram was obtained, um, as you can see here on, on, on 2D images. There is an area of discontinuity, uh, which is seen at the base of the anterior tricuspid leaflet, which results in a wide jet of tricuspid regurgitation. So on, on spectral Doppler, um, you can identify a low velocity, dense triangular signal, uh, which is consistent uh, with severe um, tricuspid regurgitation. So uh, on the next slide, uh, you can see that the TR jet uh, extends into the posterior wall of the right atrium and forming a so-called anchor sign. Uh, it appears that the jet originates uh, mostly from the gap at the base of the anterior leaflet, and there's only a mild central TR uh, as seen in this image. So on the next slide, um, You'll see the, uh, if, if we can move to the next slide, Julia, we can see the 3D images. Thank you. So um, the authors provide a high quality 3D T images of the tricuspid valve. So the, on the top uh, left panel, uh, we see the RA perspective, where is a clear oblong shaped tear, which can be seen at the base of the anterior tricuspid leaflet. And uh, they also provide trans elimination rendering that allows manipulation of the light source and nicely demonstrates the dynamic change in the size of the orifice. Um, and you can see the color Doppler uh, on this slide, uh, 3D color, which shows the TR exiting through the evulsion. So the bottom left panel demonstrates the RV perspective, similarly very nice pictures of the tear uh, using volume <laughs> rend rendering and trans illumination. Um, also demonstrating the tear uh, in the right uh, upper panel uh, is the CMR short axis view scene image, which shows marked RV dilation. And the lower panel shows a core chamber view, which nicely demonstrates the wide jet of TR originating at the point of separation of the anterior leaflet from the tricuspid analysis. In the next slide, uh, we can see the surgical correlation. Uh, you can see how the surgeon identifies the tricuspid leaflets. It shows clearly the avulsion at the anterior leaflet attachment, what, that, what we clearly saw in the 3D uh, T images. So it's a very nice pathologic correlation. Uh, in the discussion, the authors postulate that the reason for avulsion was that accident uh, that happened almost 30 years ago, uh, as I mentioned in the history. And uh, the possible mechanisms uh, that they mentioned in their discussion is uh, uh, rapid deceleration, because it was a non-penetrating injury, uh, rapid deceleration, chest wall compression, <coughs> and sudden rise in RV pressure. But they also mentioned two very unusual aspects of this case, uh, which is first, it's a late presentation, uh, decades after the injury. I guess it's a young patient, so it could tolerate uh, this degree of regurgitation for a long time. And the nature of the tear, uh, you see the tricuspid valve injuries with uh, blunt injuries, uh, non-penetrating injuries, but this type of avulsion right at the base of anterior leaflet is, is a little bit unusual. Um, so very, very interesting case. Uh, if if we can move to the next slide, um, we have. Um, I, I know this is an unusual case, but uh, recently there's been a lot of interest in tricuspid regurgitation uh, from imaging perspective, and and there are two reasons for it. So reason number one is that we started to realize how much tricuspid regurgitation matters uh, in terms of the prognosis. And reason number two, they're evolving therapies, including transcatheter therapies, that are specifically designed to, to address uh, this problem. So uh, at this point, I, I would like to address Dr. Zogby, Dr. Piazza to, to comment on, on these two uh, aspects. Thank you, Edgar. Uh, an amazing case also. 
And uh, I think this is an underreported and underrecognized entity. And I'll share with you also that we just had a case, a recent case of a distant, again, time-wise trauma. Uh, and if patient, I mean, you know, as you know very well, significant TR is, is uh, very well tolerated, right? Even acutely is very well tolerated. So, um, and you don't know whether in this situation it kind of got progressive over time, although the tear is, is also an amazing, unusual place. And I know most of the time when somebody has a, you know, motor vehicle accident and uh, we look for troponins and a right ventricular injury, contusion injury, uh, but, you know, TR may be less uh, thought of. But I think one lesson from this case is if you see unexplained significant tricuspid regurgitation, a history of a distant uh, you know, injury, uh, you know, uh, trauma would be very important. And if, in case you don't have any simple answers to, to what you see from a significance of tricuspid regurgitation. So I think that's number one. Number two also is, I would refer you to this uh, article that I think was spearheaded by Dr. Rebecca Hahn and uh, I and many others actually have been also involved in, in writing this state-of-the-art review about tricuspid regurgitation and assessing its severity. On the surface, it looks easy, but let me tell you, it is difficult to quantitate. Uh, we usually use, I mean, these are not new actually from an echo part, point of view. You look certainly at color Doppler and its three components, as we usually say, that you have to take a look at the three components of the jet and uh, you know underestimate or underemphasize if you will what's going on in the receiving chamber because at times these can be very eccentric we always look also at the hepatic veins and the flow pattern in the hepatic veins and i think with these two most often we do a semi-quantitative you know assessment in addition to what happens to the shape of the tr jet by cw the, these are the three things in general and there are there are semi-quantitative, they're more qualitative. And I think we're learning more and more how to do quantitation. Uh, and we also know from the literature that a regurgitated volume, whichever way you quantitate it, uh, from a significance point of view on the right side of the heart, may be actually a little less as opposed to more than on the left side of the heart, like mitral regurgitation. So if you see in the literature greater than 45 milliliter or more, right, is uh, becoming on the severe side. Although also knowing that you could have really wide open tricuspid regurgitation, and that was a suggestion of extending extremes of severe tricuspid regurgitation. And I know we will talk about it a little later, but don't feel, don't feel just too good about it because if you're left with severe TR, you're still left with severe TR, right? Uh, we may improve some of the symptomatology, but I think from a physiology point of view, it's still problematic. So in this review, we look at some of the quantitative measures by Doppler. Also, we bring about uh, the quantitation by CMR, which I think is very important, particularly in sinus rhythm. In atrial fibrillation, it's a different ballgame, and you got to be very careful about that. So CMR, I think, is, is good knowing also some of the difficulties in the shape of the right ventricle itself, right? And how do you quantitate it? Uh, because, you know, with some descent of the base also on the right side of the heart, you know, some issues come. So, yeah, yes, it is, I think, better quantitation-wise uh, than, than Doppler. Uh, but on the Doppler side, I, I would put a little more emphasis on color Doppler and and effective regurgitant artifice area as opposed to the usual volumetric approach because measuring the annulus of the tricuspid valve and relating it to others uh, has been fraught with more errors than, than not. So, um, and I think if you go to the next uh, uh, slide, Julia, yeah. uh, it shows basically a comparative or relative utility of these various imaging modalities uh, that are reviewed in, in this paper. So, so the method is, I think, from my end, is uh, if you see, I mean, if you see a volume overload pattern on the right side of the heart, 
that you cannot explain. Make sure that you're looking at tricuspid regurgitation. Make sure you're not missing significant pulmonic insufficiency. But for if this is not truly explained from a secondary TR, which is the vast majority of them, look for a primary etiology and don't forget trauma uh, that that could be in the distant past. That's perfect. So thank you so much. Any comments from uh, before we moved on to the next one from uh, Dr. Piazza? I think this case, of course, needed surgery, but Edgar correctly mentioned about transcatheter therapies when we have severe TR. Um, I think this paper with multimodality imaging is very important for transcatheter therapies. Um, Ed, do you have any comments on that? Um, no, I, I think surgery was the right decision uh, at this time point. Uh, you know, a uh, patient was relatively young and, um, you know, that's something that could be amenable to uh, to a nice repair. Um, you know, as, as for the mechanism that we were discussing, perhaps, you know, it's that whole story of regurgitation begets regurgitation and maybe eventually with time there was some annular dilatation that spread open more of that gap. Um, and so uh, it's a... Um, you know, as was already mentioned, um, it's a very interesting case. Uh, Perfect. Any comments, Edgar, or? No, thank you. I think that was uh, well discussed. We'll move to the next uh, case then, uh, which is the third one. And I will ask uh, Maurizio, Dr. Maurizio Teramoso to start this case. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I think this case uh, is really well connected with the previous one because now we, we have a transcatheter case and it is particularly interesting because it reports for the first time a new device which has been used in human. And this case is the result of uh, uh, multi, uh, let's say, international cooperation, as you can see from the list of the author. And uh, next slide. Um, so, as I told you, is a is a description of a case of a patient with a severe functional tricuspid regurgitation, which was a quite young, 69 year old, severely symptomatic for right side heart failure, and which was under maximal medical therapy and was judged as high risk of inoperable for surgery. Since the main mechanism for functional TR was annular dilatation, it was decided to to candidate this patient to this uh, new approach that has been already reported in, in preclinical experience, which is a complete annuloplasty device, which is called Da Vinci annuloplasty from cardiac implant. You can see here how the device is done is a complete uh, annuloplasty, complete band, which is uh, attached to the tricuspid annulus by different uh, anchors element. As all annuloplasty devices, uh, it requires a careful patient selection and procedural planning. Next slide. Here you can see a CT reconstruction uh, made with heart navigator, actually showing the um, angle of implantation. So the working plan with fluoroscopy, also showing the proximity of the right coronary artery with the tricuspid annulus, which may be injured during the implantation. And in the next slide, we see also a bit more, uh, uh, let's say, sophisticated imaging with hard navigator. Again, a really advanced planning showing each anchor and which proje projection should be um, visualized, and also the proximity with the right coronary artery for each anchor. So, a really careful uh, patient selection, also the sizing of the band, obviously. Next slide. And here you can see how the how the device works. Actually, the the axis is the jugular vein, which is uh, not uncommon for tricuspid intervention. And the the main feature of this device, which is obviously mainly echo guided implantation, is that all the anchors are implanted simultaneously. So you can see now, once you are, uh, let's say, in a good position, you inflate this balloon, and then the balloon keep the anchor in contact with the with the annulus at the inch point each anchor should be checked by transesophageal echo and then all together in a single shot way the ring is delivered 
And this is pretty much interesting and different from, from other devices. Here you can see the implantation of all the anchor and then the, the device is retrieved. So the touch that you can see now the, the ring in place. Interestingly, at the moment there is no effect. So this is just the implanted ring. But another peculiarity of this device, which is pretty smart, if you if you move to the next slide, is that uh, so here you can see the 3D how it looks like, but the analog is not activated yet. So this ring is adjustable. So in a, uh, 90 days, the operator can come back. So after that, the anchor are really well, uh, let's say, integrated within the tissue and endotelialized. The adjustment tool can be inserted. So it's keep uh, in, uh, in proximity of the jugular vein. So the, the patient come back and then the cinching mechanism is activated. So we see the efficacy of this device in a second step. It's a two step <coughs> procedure, as you can see here. First is the implantation of the ring, then they give the time the ring to, to be really well integrated within the tissue, and then the ring is adjusted. So the dimension of the ring is adjusted, is cinched, and this gives an anuloplasty effect by pushing the, the leaflet together and forcing the coaptation, making really the anuloplasty effect. Next slide. And um, I think uh, with this publication, which is related to intraprocedural imaging to guide the tricuspid intervention, we can open the discussion. We have been discussing before about planning. We have seen also here some planning, but also intraprocedural guidance of anuloplasty and leaflet devices. And now we have also replacement devices is of huge importance and uh, it requires a multimodality approach. And we are really learning how to do it. There is a lot to, to learn and a lot to do. And I would like to to ask a comment to Dr. Zogby and to Dr. Piazza regarding intraprocedural guidance of, uh, especially anuloplasty, like, like this case, but more in general about tricuspid intervention. Thank you, Maurizio. This is an amazing case, actually, to see this being deployed and guidance with imaging is, is crucial as in many of these. Um, um, uh, you know, my, my issue with it, and I'd love to have uh, also Dr. Nadine Faza talk about that, is some of the difficulties on the right side compared to the left side of the heart, right? Uh, if uh, guidance of uh, track, I mean, of mitral procedures, much easier usually because you're pretty much en face with it. Uh, and, uh, and you could see it much better. You don't have other structures that may interfere with the energy, as opposed to the right side of the heart where it's a little further out the tricuspid valve at times you may have shadowing if you have a a, uh, a an interatrial septum that is very echogenic or uh, other things that may interfere with your imaging so uh, maybe nadine you could uh, you have a lot of experience with that too also in the cat lab in the cat lab to Dr. Zogby, um, absolutely. It's much more challenging to image the cuspid valve during interventions as compared to the mitral valve. With the mitral valve, you go to your standard uh, surgical view and you're able to visualize the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet and, and guide the devices accordingly. With the tricuspid valve, some patients have really good mid osophageal images where you, where you can locate the three leaflets, but sometimes because of acoustic shadowing or difficult uh, imaging windows, you have to go down to the transgastric views and, and um, you use biplane imaging to look at orthogonal views that be able to look at the leaflets, their tips localize the site of malcoapsation. So with tri tricuspid valves, usually it's, it's more challenging to see the leaflets and you have to deploy, you know, use different angles, different um, uh, imaging windows to clearly visualize the three leaflets. 3D is definitely very helpful in such situations because you're, you're able to see um, a view of the three leaflets and if you apply color Doppler, then you're able to localize the site of malcoaptation and guide your intervention accordingly. Nico, a more technical question. Do we need an oloplasty for tricuspid valve or would you rather uh, prefer leaflet devices, combination of the two, which is your opinion? 
Yeah, it's a it's a good question, Maurizio. Uh, you know, this is of course a, a complete ring, and so with the question of um, you know uh, injuring the AV node and um, you know creating conduction disturbances comes to mind. Um, you know, we know from the um, surgical literature that um, you know rigid rings, uh, or at least uh, yeah, rigid rings do better than suture type. Uh, of annual plastic devices, um, and so, uh, of course, what's very attractive about placing a ring is that it leaves the option for other devices to come into play. So you can put in a clip, you can put in even a, a transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement. Um, but you know, as as already been said by Dr. Zogby and Dr. Faza, the the imaging of the tricuspid valve creates a lot of uh, challenges to repair devices. And so, uh, at some point, you ask yourself, uh, where do you draw the line, and how can we understand this preoperatively or pre-procedurally? Um, and I wonder if replacement is going to have a bigger role to play in the tricuspid space uh, than in the mitral space uh, because of the uh, not only of the imaging challenges but because of the fragility of the tricuspid valve space in terms of the thinness of the leaflets and so on now, the other thing that you know so, sort of struck me about this case and maybe maurizio you can make a comment uh, you've been involved with cardio bands, and we've always screened for, you know, the distance of the annulus uh, to the right coronary artery. Um, you know, these anchors are 7.5 millimeters in length, and and to me are are pretty pretty long. Um, you know, what do you think is the implications of penetrating or injuring the RCA with this device, as you sort of you know, you don't have the ability. Once you deploy, you're done. The cardio band, you had the potential to deploy and maybe come out, if I re if I remember correctly. Sure. And uh, let's say that with the cardio band, you check each anchor. Here, you you obviously you check each anchor, but then once, but then you implant all together. So probably the rate of patient rejection. I, I mean, I don't know the detail of for patient eligibility for this device, obviously, but. I have the impression, as you said, that probably uh, we we need to look more carefully to the distance between the RCA and the annulus for this device, and probably the rejection rate will, will be higher. Even if having a single shot implantation is, is really appealing, because one of the challenges of cardioband is that it's technically quite challenging. It requires uh, many hours, especially at the beginning of the learning curve. And this seems to be, at least from, from the description of the case, a bit easier and maybe maybe faster so um, but I, i'm pretty much sure that the rejection rate will, will be higher and uh, i have another point for for discussion and uh, uh, we, regarding there is another manuscript that has been recently published in the next slide in the jack intervention we have been discussing before uh, regarding the importance of and the difficulties challenging is of uh, quantify tr and now there are some initial, let's say, evidence. They are not really solid evidence, but let's say, indirect evidence that uh, uh, this new classification, this expanded classification, has also a prognostic impact. So obviously, having massive TR is worse than having severe TR. Uh, but what we don't know is how much we have to reduce TR. What do you think? Do you think is uh, a reduction from massive to to a classical severe TR is, is enough to, to observe some clinical improvement, which, which should be our target when we address TR? The question for both of you. Yeah, Maurizio, you know, we, we recently did a case, uh, just, just to relate it, you know, we did a case recently of a patient with torrential TR, a right atrium that measured 13 centimeters in height. Um, and, um, you know, we placed uh, two clips in the uh, antral septal commissure and then placed the third in the postural septal commissure. Uh, and because of increasing tricuspid valve gradients, we had to uh, reposition the clip. And that led to a tearing and creating a flail of the tricuspid valve leaflet. And, you know, I feel so bad because we could have stopped earlier 
after the two clips, uh, it went from torrential down to severe. And maybe that two grade was going to be enough. So I think you bring up a, 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 an extremely important point. Uh, sometimes lifts can be more in the tricuspid space. And, uh, you know, again, it brings up the whole question of how much um, should we reduce in the setting of RV dilatation, RV dysfunction? Uh, do we want some residual? Don't, you know, it, 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 the field is wide open right now. Uh, this is a very important point, and I, I really think we need more data. Now, let me share some opinions, you know, with you, some of my thoughts. Number one, I think this proposed classification may be helpful. We don't know at this stage of the game. And, and I say that may be helpful. And the reason for it is once you have severe and above, okay, severe and above, your prognosis is bad. The question is, if we uh, reduce from the wide open tricuspid regurgitation to still severe, we may reduce some of the symptoms. We may reduce maybe some hospitalizations, just like shown in this paper. But uh, death and the ultimate outcome may not be very different. And that could be because either we're intervening late, that's a possibility certainly in the past, or two, uh, and late, we're talking about uh, quite a bit of diastolic dysfunction of the right ventricle and uh, many of the things that would cause, you know, hepatic congestion and, uh, and low output kind of state. So we don't know this at this stage of the game, but I think this proposal is, is worth further investigation because, as you recall also, whenever you have extremes of cases similar to aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation or mitral stenosis of regurgitation, the outcome is worse. There's no question about it. We, we did not propose these classifications, uh, although the data of the literature shows that, you know, your outcome is not as good once you go to extremes. Here you have, uh, you have a clinical scenario where, you know, the incidence of more than severe quantitation wise can be tolerated and is seen clinically. And we don't know whether reducing them from a torrential to a severe really have some clinical uh, impact. I know we've had some cases and these are you know, small cases where you know, you're able to diurese patients or uh, you know, do other clinical implications, but ultimately the ultimate outcome is uh, quality of life and duration of life. And I think these are these are the two things that I think will hopefully will shed more light on it. Perfect. Any further comments or um, shall I move to the next piece then? And we could always discuss later on uh, if we have time. So the next piece will be presented by Dr. Uh, Rafael Vidal Perez. Uh, Rafa. Uh, thank you for the kind invitation to join you in this in this webinar. And my case is is subthreshold aortic valve calcium scores in severe aortic stenosis and threatening cardiac amyloidosis. It's a case from the Cleveland Clinic, and it's a series of cases. I think it's it's interesting because shows something that is not so uncommon now that with this situation of low for, flow, low gradient. Uh, aortic stenosis and in this case series uh, they show you so tries to show us the problems that the calcium score could have in this kind of patient they show three different patients i think interesting also the case from the european perspective because you see here african-american patients usually in europe this is not the um, most usual presentation but it's it's good to know the difference and how the presentation of the cardiac amyloid. And another thing that is interesting in the series is all, all patients, but they have another problem. They have the, for one side, this uh, aortic uh, low flow, low gradient that is defined by different echo parameters. There is a very good editorial that we comment later on on how is the, the, the flow chart for the diagnosis. And here the main, the main discussion is this value of calcium score to tell us if you are in a severe aortic stenosis or not. In the European guidelines of 2017, 
they say that there is one classification that could make you think that it's likely that the aortic stenosis could be severe on this in on this pattern or low flow low gradient and it's it's a, when you have agaston values of more than 100,000 for women or more than 2000 uh, agaston units in men it's very interesting also in the in the case not showing the in the slide there is a figure where it shows where the patients were using this classification and we find that in a patient with amyloid you will probably underestimate that values because the, these patients are a, a low flow, low grading, aortic stenosis, severe, but probably the, the pro, the, here the, the, the problem is that the calcium score was low. So probably you are missing some patients uh, for treatment using this classification. And then there is an interesting discussion in the paper why the patients with amyloidosis have these low values, even having, having that diagnosis of uh, severe aortic stenosis. And I think it's interesting. And the next the next step is is that that we show here that is probably going from the CT from the echo to CT, and probably the CT can be the substitute of the nuclear medicine. That is the thing that they try to show in this interesting paper of of, of Jack imaging that we will comment in in a moment. I think it's to put all the things together because for for me it's very interesting in the case series uh, that the patients were two of them where the diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis was bio with biopsy. And probably we tend now not to use this, this approach. I think we are more used to go through uh, chemical labs to exclude uh, antibodies and use the technetium test for the nuclear medicine. So, so it's, it's, it's curious how this case were uh, approached, but of course it's one way to do it, but probably less, less aggressive with these imaging techniques. And I think the next step is this paper that is through the city that you are going to evaluate all these uh, probably uh, Agaston score, but you can get even with the city to know if the patient could probably have a pattern of suggestion can suggest you that you are in, with an amyloid patient because with these extracellular uh, values. So I think it's very interesting because you have more things in one technique. You don't need to go also for nuclear medicine. You, you can get everything from the CT scan. And they show a nice algorithm that you have the likely diagnosis, then they suggest you to go for nuclear, but uh, at least you have uh, one more orientation. And I think it's it's interesting. What what uh, I, I open now the discussion because the case at the at the end show us that we have a limitation with the with the calcium score for evaluation of this a special situation that is very common on on the aortic stenosis of these cardiac amyloid patients. Uh, uh, around 80% of the patients has has this low flow, low gradient pattern. So it makes difficult sometimes the diagnosis. Probably the amyloid is depositing on the on the valves and the thickening is because of that. But it's also discussed in the paper. So I I opened the discussion first with Dr. Sobi about how to approach these patients. That that it is important how the new ways to do it, I think they show in this paper. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, that's a very interesting case actually highlights to me some of the limitations of, uh, of what's written and some of the recommendations. I really think we have to be very transparent in these situations. A calcium score is not a deciding factor in aortic stenosis to me. Uh, remember also that we are talking about a particular population here, right? Is the degenerative aortic stenosis. So other people in the world who have, let's say, a bicuspid aortic valve and somebody who is 40 or 50 years of age, right? Uh, rheumatic aortic stenosis don't have much calcifications and yet they have severe aortic stenosis. So let's not fool ourselves to say that Calcification correlates one to one almost with severity of aortic stenosis. I think these cases show us that at times you're going to have severe aortic stenosis with much less calcifications. And I would also posit to you that you're going to have cases of a lot of calcifications with non severe aortic stenosis. So we have to be honest with ourselves regarding that and why because the narrowing of the orifice of the aortic valve 
right? Narrowing of the aortic, orifice of the aortic valve. This is not where the most of the calcium is present. Hmm. In degenerative aortic stenosis, the vast majority of the calcium is either in the annulus or in the cusp itself. You go back, let's all go back to pathology and see them as opposed to a rheumatic etiology. So yes, overall they're correlated, but the correlation is not very tight, which means that we have to be clinicians and making sure that we put all these data together. Now we have a nice table here and in the guidelines, there are tables in the American Society, of, uh, there are tables, et cetera. But my message to all of you who are watching is, I really personally think physiology first, meaning if I have a severe aortic stenosis with high gradient and low valve area, this is it, that's number one. If I have a low flow situation, I will do all my best to increase flow and reassess, be it dobutamine, whatever it is that you wanna do. I reserve usually a calcium score if I cannot improve cardiac output. If I'm stuck, if there is no increase in cardiac output and I cannot remeasure, then I could use them to at least help me a little bit because there is no other way for me to understand the physiology of these valves. And maybe keep in mind that a calcium score, low or high, doesn't necessarily tell me about the severity of the aortic valve because we just had a case who didn't have amyloidosis, had a calcium score of 400, and she is 75 years of age. Barely, I mean, it's there, but most of the stenosis, and it's not rheumatic. And actually, Raj Makar, you know, from uh, Cedar sinai published, I think, in Jack, uh, I don't know, two years ago or something like this, of a series of cases that had lower calcifications on a CT scan. So from my end, the message is put it all together. A calcium score doesn't necessarily mean mild or severe. <laughs> there's a lot hmm. of heterogeneity and there is a lot, the bandwidth of severity is quite large. So, so be careful. I think these are great cases actually. And hmm. doctor, we, by the way, we have a question uh, from Dr. Eduardo Zancanaro. He says, is it possible to have a clear correlation between aortic stenosis and amyloidosis? They had some patients treated for aortic stenosis, and some years later, they were discovered to have amyloidosis. Um, so, is it possible to have a more thorough check on the pathology and um, also in non-suspected patients? We know, we know that there is a higher prevalence. The question is causality but there is a higher prevalence in patients with aortic stenosis and severe what looks hypertrophy, right, uh, in these patients. But at the same time, they are in the older generation of patients, right? This is correlated to a, mm -hmm. a certain age, degenerative AS, and also where the likelihood of both diseases are increased, right? And when you see aortic stenosis, you see hypertrophy, right? And uh, this is where, or seemingly hypertrophy and could be infiltration, but I'm not sure about a mechanism that relates them together. Yes, you could have deposit of amyloid in the valves in the other structures of the, the question is relating it to true aortic stenosis, uh, you know, severity per se. I, I'm not familiar with, and I, I would welcome, you know, the input of all the panelists. Another another point I think interesting on the management because they come together that is also show in the in the in the editorial it's the management you know, because sometimes there were some warnings about that, about the the prognosis because if you are substituting a valve on a patient with cardiac amyloid what could be the be better result maybe go for tabar instead of surgery I think there are some discussion also on that on that side I don't know if other persons of the panel want to to address that. I have one, one short comment. There is a, a a short series from the John Webb Group from Vancouver of a, a post uh, post mortem uh, so autopsy of patient who had uh, lethal mechanical complication during TAVI. 
and uh, most of them i don't remember the, the, the where it was published but most of them were were diagnosed with cardiac amyloidosis and this was not known so there is there is for sure when we see a let's say a hypertrophy which is too much as compared to the grade of stenosis we, we should always think to to, to amyloidosis uh, and we should always take uh, let's say uh, a, a bit more attention because the risk of damaging the ventricle with the wire perforation it was mainly wire perforation i think so the tissue is probably uh, but obviously if, if this is better or worse with the uh, saver than the taver i don't know because in the paper, if you look the series, is the, the prognosis at the end is bad because the, the survival is not so long. It's like the, long, the one was 2.5 months and the other was like 20 months. So I think it's, it's a, how to say, a population a, a little bit different probably from the normal one of only aortic stenosis. Yeah. So I Yes, Nadine. Sometimes there are clues from from the history when you see patients for you know TAVR evaluation. You can you know ask about bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome. You can look at their labs, look for kidney dysfunction, look at the echo, for example, if you apply strain and look for an apical sparing pattern, IV hypertrophy by atrial dilation. So some some of these patients can have features suggestive of amyloidosis that you can uh, elicit by history taking and looking at the echo more closely. Yes. <laughs> That's perfect. Uh, so that's uh, that's great. So actually, I noticed what uh, Dr. Zogby also mentioned that the, the second patient had a calcium score of 250, the third 761. So you're right in the, in this assessment. Um, any further comments in general about the cases that we discussed before we close the session? Not really. I mean, these are amazing cases. Actually, very. Uh, very informative and, and a great discussion. So thank you for for putting this together, Dr. Grapsa. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you all. Uh, thank you for your comments, for your uh, sharing your experience, and really grateful to those uh, the audience that they they attended this session.